Good morning. We'll come to order. The Tactical Air and Land Forces Subcommittee meets today to review the Army and Marine Corps ground modernization programs in fiscal year 2021 budget requests. First off, I'd like to thank our witnesses for being with us today. We certainly appreciate the work that went into this year's budget request to Congress. Let me tell you up front, this committee is especially we all are frustrated at the administration's disregard for congressional authority to make appropriations and the faithful ex execution of those laws. Attempts to reprogram funds as authorized by Congress for Army programs such as the National Guard Reserve Equipment, tactical wheeled vehicles without prior approval and contrary to our disapproval undermines this relationship. I can't underscore that enough. Our ability to gather to manage risk in the most realistic and timely manner. This should be, this should worry not only us, but you as the witnesses that we continue this. And as uh, Chairman Smith said uh, just the other day, the national defense strategy does not include the southern border wall. Uh, as we highlighted earlier this week, the full committee Army posture hearing and also last week at the Navy and the Marine Corps posture hearing, the committee is eager to hear further details from today's witnesses on how the services are evaluating trade-offs, acceptable risks between investment priorities, current needs, and the industrial base stability. The Army made significant changes and tough choices in the FY20 request to fund future capabilities without, without, an increase in their budget top line during the night court process. We understand the Marine Corps is also evaluating programs line by line in an effort to reallocate funds and modernize priorities. We understand that the goal of achieving a modernized and lethal ground force that can match the strength of peer-to-peer -peer and near-peer competitors by 2028. However, once we lose our ability to build and maintain weapon systems, it can be nearly impossible to get that back. We have a duty to examine with great scrutiny those choices we made both for today and for the future to ensure we don't get it wrong. Our subcommittee intends to examine the rationale behind these choices with the senior leadership here today. I would like to welcome the distinguished panel of witnesses. First, Dr. Bruce Jetty, Assistant Secretary of the Army for Acquisition, Acquisition, Logistics, and Technology. Good to have you back. General John Murray, Commanding General, Army Futures Command. Good to see you again. Lieutenant General James Pascarette, Army Deputy Chief of Staff G8. Mr. James Gert, the Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Research, Development, and Acquisition, who is on quite a roll this week. Uh, <laughs> Lieutenant General Eric Smith, Commanding General, Marine Corps Combat Development Command, and Deputy Commandant for Combat Development and Integration. We look forward to your testimony and discussing the topics that we brought up earlier this morning and ones that you've been hearing about across the spectrum. Before we begin, I'd like to turn to my ranking member, Mrs. Hartzell, for any comments she would like to make. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I would like to echo your concerns with some of the reprogramming uh, that we've seen taking place and hope that we can work that out to make sure that our uh, men and women in uniform have what they need and Congress still has the ability to uh, prioritize those assets. But I, I want to thank each of our witnesses today. Thank you for your service and all that you do for our soldiers and our Marines. And we have a lot to cover here to relatively short amount of time. And this uh, distinguished panel of witnesses, I uh, look forward to having your expertise and this healthy discussion. This budget request for ground system modernization is essentially flat when compared to last year's levels. General McConville, the chief of staff of the Army, stated that, quote, the Army's budget request represents a downturn in real purchasing power from FY20, and that pro progress uh, is a risk, unquote. The Army has realigned approximately $2.4 billion in fiscal year 2021. These funds were taken from Army-identified lower-priority programs by eliminating or reducing approximately 80 programs across the future year's defense program to better invest in the Army's Big Six modernization priorities. Programs such as the Joint Like Tactical ve Vehicle, the Joint Assault Bridge, and munitions had quantities reduced. 
while programs such as the Advanced Precision Kill Weapon System were eliminated. The Marine Corps is also in the process of a major redesigned effort, and the Commandant, General Berger, Berger has uh, stated that, quote, we will divest of legacy defense programs and force structure that support legacy capabilities, end quote. So I fully recognize the importance of prioritizing modernization efforts necessary for great power competition that aligns with the national defense strategy, especially when budgets are flat with no real growth. I appreciate the Army's efforts in finding savings through reform and making these difficult choices and trades. However, we need to better understand the near-term strategic and operational risks that may result. I look forward to working together to find that right balance between current readiness and future modernization. So given this focus on next generation capabilities, I expect the witnesses to discuss how they are balancing investments in capabilities for the future fight, while at the same time upgrading legacy platforms for current threats and improve tactical readiness. Regarding Army modernization, the budget contains $10.6 billion for 31 efforts being worked by the eight cross-functional teams to address the Army's top six modernization priorities. This is about a 26% increase over fiscal year 2020 levels. I'm sure our witnesses will touch on most of these programs today, and I'm interested in hearing more about the status of the optionally manned fighting vehicle, indirect fire protection capability, the next generation squad weapon, and long-range precision fires. Regarding Marine Corps modernization, a full-rate production decision is planned for the amphibious combat vehicle later this year, and I'd like the witnesses to update us on this program and discuss any challenges that could be associated with a production ramp-up. Finally, I want to stress the importance of jointness between the Army and the Marine Corps. I'd like our witnesses to discuss how they are communicating and coordinating on critical modernization programs that could address similar operational requirements, such as body armor, long-range precision fires, and next-generation small arms weapons. So I thank the chairman for organizing this important hearing, and I yield back. Thank you. Uh, I understand each of the Army witnesses will provide short opening remarks, starting with Dr. Jetty, followed by General Murray and General uh, uh, Pascaret. Uh, then, Ms. Gertz, you'll do it for the Marine Corps with that. Without objection, the full uh, prepared statements will be in today's hearing record. Hearing none, Mr. Jetty, welcome, or Dr. Jetty, forgive me. Chairman Norcross, uh, Ranking Member Hartzler, and distinguished members of the Subcommittee on Tactical Air and Land Forces, uh, good morning. Thank you for your invitation to discuss the Army Ground Modernization Program and the res resources requested in the President's budget for FY21. I am pleased to be joined by my Army colleagues, General Murray and Lieutenant General Pascoret, as well as our Navy and Marine Corps counterparts. We appreciate your making our written statement a part of today's record. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the Army is nearly two years into the most transformational change in moderniz modernization in the last four decades. We recognize the need to rapidly and persistently modernize our forces to stay ahead of technological change and either reclaim or strengthen our advantage over adversaries. We are committed to getting the right equipment into the hands of the soldier at the right time. There have been challenges, but I'm happy to report to you that we, we uh, confront those challenges as one team, together with unmatched collective experience, close collaboration, and synchronized unity of effort. Our soldiers deserve no less. Because of this close collaboration, the Army modernization enterprise is gaining momentum, greater speed, efficiency, and effectiveness, as we focus on delivering the capability outlined in the Army's modernization priorities. We are making significant progress. There are many reasons why, Mr. Chairman, uh, but chief among them is the unique relationship between the cross-functional teams of Army Futures Command and our program executive offices. Together, they are bringing system concepts and designs to life. Together, they are aligning requirements, development, and acquisition expertise with representatives from testing, logistics, science and technology, and other important Army communities. Again, our soldiers deserve no less. 
we are making significant progress in our reform efforts as well. The Army continues to implement the initiatives granted by Congress in order to streamline and gain those efficiencies in the acquisition process. Let me highlight just a few. Middle Tier Acquisition Authority, Section 804, allows us to rapidly prototype and accelerate select efforts within the Army's modernization priorities and enable soldier feedback for further refinement of those requirements. Currently, under MTA, the Army has 11 rapid prototyping efforts and one rapid fielding effort. Other transaction authority allows the Army to attract small companies and non-traditional businesses, a known source of technological innovation. In fiscal year 19, the Army awarded 830 agreements valued at roughly $5 billion. Excuse me, $5 million. Additionally, to streamline acquisition and deliver results, one of my first actions upon entering uh, this office was to delegate milestone decision authority of acquisition category two, three, and four programs to our program executive officers, and when they felt appropriate, level three and four below them. This alone has contributed greatly to efficiency and effectiveness within our acquisition community. The Army ASALT, my office in particular, has reviewed all of our policies to ensure that they support sound business planning and incentive, uh, incentivize partnerships with industry. Our approach to intellectual property, for example, is designed to make us a savvier partner by stressing early planning for IP requirements, requiring tailored IP strategy, ensuring negotiations of customer licenses and vendors early in the process, and encouraging open communications with industry throughout. We also have established a unified policy on advanced manufacturing to achieve a strategic investment by both Army and industry, as well as the systemic adoption of additive manufacturing throughout the acquisition life cycle. We are working closely with our Navy and Air Force partners on key and common technical interests, such as counter UAS, hypersonics, and directed energy. Mr. Chairman, the bottom line in our mutual efforts is that the Army's modernization program takes time and money. We are working to achieve efficiency wherever possible, and we need sufficient predictable, sustained, and timely funding to ensure a successful outcome. Thank you again for this opportunity to discuss Army modernization and for your strong support of the Army programs. I look forward to your questions. Chairman Norcross, Ranking Member Hartzler, and distinguished members of this subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of the men and women of Army Futures Command, the soldiers, engineers, scientists, and civilians from privates to PhD that are working every day to transform our Army. And I appreciate the opportunity to join Dr. Bruce Jetty and Lieutenant General Jim Pascarette as we continue as one team to drive that transformation. I'm also pleased we're able to have this conversation with our Navy and Marine Corps counterparts, Dr. Gertz and Lieutenant General Smith. No service is able to go it alone, and as history has shown, joint teams win, and modernization is no exception. And speaking of winning, our Chief General McConville is known for his phrase, winning matters. From the joint force to industry to academia to our allies, I say winning matters, but winning together matters more. Last year, we published a 2019 Army Modernization Strategy, and our written testimony echoes that framework. First is how we fight. Our concept, multi-domain operations, is the Army's contribution to the Joint Staff Warfighting concept called Joint All-Domain Operations. Second, what we fight with. These are the capabilities and force structures that we are designing and delivering. And third and finally, who we are. We are a team of teams centered around the powerful intersection of requirements and acquisition. And as Dr. Jenny mentioned, we at AFC and ASALT will continue to leverage that close partnership all the way down to the cross-functional teams and their program executive officer counterparts. In 2020, we are building on the momentum that we gained in 2019 and making it irreversible. And there are two key components to that uh, momentum. First is discovery. We are seeking out and finding the ideas and innovations that solve Army problems. From our own S&T efforts, partnerships with universities to traditional and non-traditional industry, winning together involves innovation from every sector. Second is delivery. We have already fielded enhanced night vision goggle binocular as well as the, com com the, excuse me, the command post computing environment, 
a component of the common operating environment. And in both cases, statement of need to delivery of those capabilities was less than 18 months. We also have successfully test shot the precision strike missile and extended range cannon artillery, greatly extending the range of two key long range precision fire delivery systems. Looking forward, we will continue to capitalize on the success we've had with the Integrated Visual Augmentation System, better known as IVAS. In all of our efforts, we are leveraging a soldier-centered design approach to delivering capability, putting soldiers at the center of our, of our production. Within this approach, we are committed to learning early and learning often. This means focusing on characteristics, working with industry and our soldiers to make sure that when we do write requirements, we get them right the first time. The key to getting this all right is our people. And in the coming year, you will see initiatives that give us the flexibility we need to seek out the best talent and manage it as we develop the innovative workforce our Army needs. And we will never be done modern, modernizing. Uh, I call that persistent modernization. And we are pairing with our scientists and concept writers to look holistically at what could be. Our assessments will inform both future concepts and current S&T investments. This feedback loop allows us to maintain our lead in a rapidly advancing world. There's much more to discuss, and I look forward to answering your questions here today, and it's truly a privilege to lead and represent here today the tremendously talented soldiers, civilians, and families of the United States Army Futures Command. Thank you. Chairman Norcross, Ranking Member Hartzler, distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today about the FY21 Army Modernization Budget Request. I appreciate the opportunity to be on this panel given the close cooperation that exists between AFC, ASALT, and G8 in modernizing the United States Army. <clears throat> I also echo General Murray's uh, thoughts about being here with the, our, our, our brothers from the United States Marine Corps. The, FY, uh, the Army's FY21 uh, base budget request includes $34 billion in research development and acquisition, 31% of which is aligned against the Army's six modernization priorities. To put that percentage into pers perspective, 31% of the Army's RDA account is aligned against just under 6% of the programs and efforts in the Army's equipping portfolio, a testament to the Army's commitment to modernizing in accordance with the National Defense Strategy. This investment commitment in support of the modernization priorities was, was not via an increase in RDA. In fact, the Army's RDA top line has remained relatively flat over the last three years, again, about $34 billion. However, inside this account, there has been a significant increase in RDT&E for game-changing technological developmental efforts overseen by Army Futures Command, resourced through a corresponding decrease in procurement of legacy systems. This shift was realized through the deep dive process that I can outline during our time together today. From a FIDEP perspective, the Army reprioritized internally $7.4 billion in RDA, resulting in the eliminations or reduction of 80 programs. These dollars, along with dollars previously identified in the PB20 deep dive, resulted in $9 billion increase, a $9 billion increase in the PB21 FIDEP for the six modernization priorities. In total, there is $63 billion aligned against the six modernization priorities in the PB21 FIDEP. Beyond the Army's modernization priorities, this budget and associated FIDEP also invested in other parts of, the Army required, uh, of our Army required to fight and win against a near-peer threat in the future. This includes investments in key enablers, those capabilities we must have that directly support the next generation systems being developed by AFC. Additionally, we be began filling gaps in our ability to wage large-scale combat operations that were created 15 years ago when we optimized our formations and equipment for counterinsurgency operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. All three investment areas, the modernization priorities, the key enablers, and large-scale combat operation gaps are necessary for the Army to fight and win in the future, and it's reflected in the FY21 budget submission. I'll close by quoting uh, Secretary McCarthy. This budget is about finishing what we started over the last three years to realize the Army we must have to fight and win in the future. I sincerely appreciate your time today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. 
Chairman Norcross, Ranking Member Hartzler, distinguished members of the subcommittee, thanks for the opportunity to appear before you today to address the Department of the Navy's fiscal year 2021 budget request on ground vehicles. Joining me today is Lieutenant General Eric Schmidt, Deputy Commandant for Marine Corps Combat Development and Integration. With your permission, I'll provide a few brief remarks for the both of us. We thank the subcommittee and all of Congress for your leadership and steadfast support for the Department of the Navy. Our 21 budget submission delivers ground vehicle and weapon readiness while modernizing our force to deliver a more lethal force in support of the national defense strategy. It demonstrates our continued commitment to ensuring our Marines have the equipment they need to execute our national security. The Marine Corps ground portfolio has shown significant progress over the last five years and is a top performing portfolio in the Department of the Navy. Programs are consistently meeting or delivering ahead of schedule, putting capabilities into the hands of the Marines in the field today. We're working closely with our Army partners here, most notably on the JLTV program, but across the joint force, including SOCOM, uh, executing my favorite form of R&D, rip off and deploy. If somebody else has it and we can get it in the hands of the Marines faster, that's the way we're gonna do it. And, uh, and that is working exceedingly well. Uh, and I look forward to having that discussion here today. Last fiscal year, uh, the Marine Corps, uh, speaking of a program like that, fielded the JLTVs reaching IOC in August, 10 months ahead of our program baseline. To date, the Marine Corps has fielded over 500 of these vehicles. The amphibious combat vehicle continues to execute on its baseline schedule, and it will enter uh, operational tests this fiscal year with a full rate production decision this fall. The Gator Radar has currently fielded 10 low rate initial production systems, successfully completing its operational test and achieving its full rate production decision this year. The Marine Corps' highest ground modernization priority, the ground-based anti-ship missile, couples an unmanned JLTV-based launch platform with the Navy Strike Missile. By leveraging both of these proven capabilities, we're able to rapidly accelerate that capability uh, at a very affordable cost. Uh, and that will allow us to attack our adversary's sea lines of communication while defending our own. These and the many other programs reflect a lot of hard work from the entire community and show the increased integration between the Navy and the Marine Corps' acquisition requirements communities, integration with our joint partners, in the, and in doing so, we are putting transformative capabilities into the hands of our Marines. Continued budget predictability and stability will be necessary to maintain this success. Thank you for the strong support this subcommittee has always provided our Marines and our families. We thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today, and we look forward to answering your questions. Thank you for your opening statements. We were just alerted that they're going to be moving votes up. So Ms. Hartzler and I are going to defer our questions and go right to our uh, committee. Your remarks were combined, correct? Thank you for that. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I echo the concerns that the chairman and the ranking member expressed over uh, reprogramming. Uh, Dr. Jetty and General Murray, the Assistant Secretary for Acquisition, Army Futures Command, and Army Materiel Command have apparently reached a transition to sustainment agreement on hundreds of Army weapon systems and platforms, including current ground systems. We understand that transition to sustain generally provides a path to a systems disposal. What is the significance of this agreement from your perspective? What objectives does this agreement seek to achieve, and how will you know if the objectives are achieved? Thank you, ma'am. Um, so uh, we took a, a quite a, a focused look at trying to uh, determine how we could free up capital uh, for, uh, for actually our investment portfolio and realized that we tend not to transition things to sustainment we keep moving them along, and we need to balance between those things that, that are modernized and about at the end of their useful life and are going to be replaced by something else in the near future, and layered that in to a, 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 a collective group, uh, Army Material Command, Army Futures Command. So Futures is concerned about what we need and, and when we need it. Uh, Material Command is looking at um, can they accept it? How can they sustain it? And then the purpose of ASALT in this process is to determine whether we 
discontinue producing anything that's not needed and how we transition that to sustainment. I, in fact, sit on both the equipping peg and the, S, uh, and the sustainment peg. So I'm sort of the linchpin between the two. We established a committee, a methodology, and went through all of, all of the programs to include meetings with all the PEOs to determine which things ought to be transitioned and could be. That, that led to this, this number in the vicinity of 100. We're using that same model to develop a similar methodology to determine what things can be transitioned to divestiture. Uh, we haven't finished that, and that's part of the objective this year, is to determine what we can get out of the force. Um, and we do know that we have a good number of systems that we sustain in small numbers. Uh, they tend to be associated with lower priority issues, which means that they tend not to be looked at for replacement items along the road. So we are making a, a significant effort in trying to figure out how to get the same type of effort going against divestiture as we had going against the transition. Ma'am, the only thing I'd, I'd add is we've got an entire four-star command called Army Material Command that's responsible for sustainment. And so as we looked at what was being uh, funded within the equipping peg was in the CRDA accounts that all the, the investment in future systems came from, there were a number of things that made sense to transition under the leadership of uh, General Gus Perna uh, to sustainment. And you said sustainment to divestiture, and as Dr. Jetty pointed out, it's actually two entirely different processes. For the divestiture piece that Dr. Jetty mentioned, the majority of that input is coming from uh, Ar U.S. Army Forces Command. So we're asking units what equipment does no longer leaves a motor pool, no longer leaves an arms room, no longer leaves a supply room just because soldiers don't use it anymore. And that's really the equipment we're focused on is with input from soldiers is equipment they don't need to accomplish their mission. And so if I understood you correctly, the equipment you were just speaking of is is transition to divestiture, which you're saying is separate from transition to sustainment. It is two different things. The transition to sustainment at this point uh -huh. is, is to sustain for continued use. It's not to divest. And then we have taken on a second effort, as Dr. Jetty mentioned, to begin to look at things we can completely divest of. And that's the only way you really truly free up resources as opposed to just moving it around uh, who has responsibility for paying. And so the only way you ever truly free up resources for the Army is through divestiture. That's helpful, because in my conversations with General Perna, there was some concern that in transitioning, the transition to sustainment was moving things out of the capability of updating them and investing in them and um, reconfiguring them for more modern use. Um, and those are some of my fears. I wonder if you could address that. And, and that was part of it, and, and it was uh, a long process that, that Gus Perna, General Perna, uh, had a, and at the end, Dr. Jetty and, and Gus Perna and I sat down and, and we decided what was going to transition to sustainment, what wasn't, and there was complete agreement amongst the three of us. So transition to sustainment does not necessarily mean there won't be further investments. There's always going to have to be investments to maintain the capability. The maintenance has got to go into extending the life, ex uh, et cetera, et cetera. Fundamentally, and not necessarily in all cases, what transition to sustainment means, there will be no further upgrades. So go to a better weapon system to put a new engine in something, but the sustainment dollars are still there. That, that sort of allays some of my concerns when we're talking about um, issues of updating them. And I see my time's expiring, so thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we're going to break it down to three minutes so we can get some questions in. We have about 20 minutes before the members will have to leave for vote. Mr. Mitchell, you have been focused on the OMFV. Uh, certainly, we have an opportunity to have that discussion here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We'll have that. <clears throat> I try to make a brief comment. And uh, I, it's unfortunate that all of our hearings, or many of them, have started out talking about reprogramming. So at this point in time, I think I need to make some comment on that. I believe our border is part of our national security in contrast to some that are here. Unfortunately, Congress has a duty in Article 1, one they failed to undertake because compromise is a four-letter word. We can't compromise. We failed to address the border wall or border security adequately. We failed to compromise internally or with the administration. So you're left with reprogramming money that should go to other things. I'm sorry for you. It's no kind of way to make decisions. We failed in our responsibility here, Mr. Chair. 
We failed here. We failed working with the administration. That's our responsibility, not yours. And frankly, it's a shame. Let me go to the option man fighting vehicle. Uh, I'll keep the same team I've had in the, in the full hearing on with the Army. I'm concerned I have not gotten an adequate explanation of the abrupt cancellation of the procurement and what that does to the schedule, what delays that creates the schedule. You all identified, we agreed that was a critical item. Now we're, in my opinion, pushed back. And no one has answered what the, uh, what the all cost and delays will be in multiple inquiries. Frankly, I've gotten a whole lot of discussion around it, to be very honest with you. So I'm not going to ask you to address it here, but I am going to ask you all to address it for the record of what happens from the original schedule to the new schedule on that option and fighting vehicle and what the cost changes are. Uh, we want an answer for the record. It's an issue that is a concern for many people here because that was a pretty abrupt change. The other point I will make with you is that we, we were increasingly asking the private sector, venture capital, to invest in innovation, technology, development of some of these things. People did that to a fair extent, and we abruptly canceled it. How, what impact do we believe that's going to have, Dr. Jetty, you take to what it's going to have in the future when we're telling people, please do that, and then all of a sudden we changed our mind? Uh, how do we fix that now at this point? Uh, yes, sir. If we were to abandon the effort on OMFE, we would, it would be a wasted effort. It would be a wasted expenditure on the part of the company. I was actually at their facility and talking to them just last week. Um, and um, we've made it clear OMFE is continuing. The, the, the objective that we were pursuing is unchanged. Uh, it's the methodology by which we're trying to get there. Their investments um, will continue to contribute to their next uh, their next submission, and we expect them to, to participate. Let me make one quick point, which is the I serve in the Future Defense Task Force. One thing that's become abundantly clear to the task force members is in our procurement process, we outline a problem, then we tell folks frequently how to solve the problem rather than asking the private sector, rather than asking contractors, what do you think is the best way to solve this problem and see what innovation we get? And that's part of the problem, I think, happened in this procurement. So I would desperately ask you folks to start with your, your acquisition folks to say, just tell the, the sector what your problems are, what you're trying to address, and let's see what ideas they have rather than believe we can cook them all within the five walls of the Pentagon. Thank you, I'm gonna yield back because we only got three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Val. Yeah, General Murray, um, I think what I'll do is I'll, uh, I'll defer the debate over the reprogramming for another day, uh, but I would like to say that uh, after you and I spent one full day on the border, uh, I want to personally thank you uh, for uh, a fulfilling experience with uh, our Vietnam veteran uh, pinning ceremony. Uh, I, I firsthand saw what you were uh, doing with respect to academic research in the medical technology field and in the space field, and just want to thank you uh, for the time uh, you spent with us down on the border. Sir, it was, it was my pleasure, um, and uh, especially the opportunity to, to pin some, some uh, pins on some very well-deserving and, and long-overdue Vietnam veterans, so thank you for that opportunity, and then, of course, the visit to the border and, and the university. This gentleman yield back. Mr. Turner. So, Murray, I'm a big fan of Futures Command and, of course, of your leadership, as you know. I had the opportunity yesterday to hear your comments at the McLeese Conference. Uh, you told a story about uh, your work and, and the, uh, uh, the work that the Futures Command has done to take even um, the warfighters' uh, input into goggles. Um, would you please retell that story as to how that helps you formulate um, what you're doing, and if you have another one uh, from your comments yesterday that would also be insightful for this committee, if you would tell that, I'd appreciate it. Yes, sir, and you're challenging me to remember what I said yesterday. Um, <laughs> the, uh, so specifically, and, and I, I think the, the comment refers to, and I referred to an opening remark, soldier-centered design, um, and it dawned on me very early that one of the, uh, the commercial industry's best practices is customer-centered design, and, and I realized that we did not do that with our soldiers. The first time soldiers saw a piece of equipment was when we delivered for a limited uh, user, user test, and it usually didn't fare well because we didn't have soldiers involved from the front. So that has become a, a standard principle for everything, not only 
within the cross-functional teams, but thanks to Dr. Jetty throughout the acquisition community that we get soldiers involved early and often in terms of the design. A couple clear examples, and ma'am, you mentioned next generation squad weapon. Uh, so we started off with five different vendors and we have had soldiers, and when I say soldiers, it's not me and General Pasqueret, it's the privates, the sergeants, and the captains and lieutenants who will actually be using the equipment provide input to us, and then importantly, we listen to their input and make modifications. I've asked is probably the clearest example uh, that I could think of. We've had over 6,000 hours of soldier touch points. We are doing it within inside of three-week sprints. So every three weeks, the engineers will put the equipment on soldiers, and soldiers will provide feedback to the engineers, and engineers will make that change over the next three weeks, and we'll just repeat that cycle consistently. Um, as an example, uh, we were on path to, de to deliver uh, a set of goggles that could see 600 meters. Uh, we put them on a soldier, and the soldier said, why do you think I need to see 600 meters? Because when you go long, it's a very narrow field of view. You get no peripheral vision. Mm -hmm. And the insight was they would much rather be able to see to the side for situational awareness to be able to see 600 meters. So if we had proceeded on a normal path, we would have delivered a pair of goggles that soldiers would not have been happy with. And so we made that design modification, um, and they can now get what they want. Plus, the sight we're delivering that will be on the rifle is capable of seeing 600 meters, and they can see through their sight with their goggles. So we really got the best of both worlds. If, if I can quickly add, uh, and it may relate back to the last question concerning OMFE, our path forward is very similar for OMFE, although modified because we can't make a large number of replicants of vehicles uh, using uh, to, to pursue this methodology and a maturation process uh, for OMFE, uh, starting with industry, digital, rough digital uh, 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 prototype, fine digital prototype, a physical prototype, and we've, we've had reform in acquisition. What, what General Murray uh, has, uh, has worked with us on is methodology by which we can reform requirements development. So at every one of those interfaces, there is a revision of the requirements informed by industry, informed by the prototyping, informed by touch points by soldiers, digital touch points by soldiers, modeling and simulation. We'll continue, Mr. Brandeisi. Yield back, Mr. Bacon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> My first question is on the joint all domain command and control, the JAD C2 that the Air Force is working on. <clears throat> I know the goal is to try to make it integral through all of our services, and your, your future weapon systems will need to dovetail in. How is that working? Are we getting good coordination with the Air Force and putting a, a joint JAD C2 plan together? So um, JADC2, the concept of any sensor, any shooter, any C2 network in near real time is actually a joint concept. Uh, so it's a joint staff concept. The, the Air Force has an effort going on. We obviously have an effort going on. The Marine Corps and the Navy have an effort going on. And to answer your question directly, sir, is yes, we're all integrated under, it's, it, under the leadership of the joint staff uh, J6 right now. Um, it, and the, the only question is how you deliver it and how you know, how you establish the most important thing, because if you get down to what I just described, it all comes down to data and data architectures. Uh -huh. and so how you build that architecture that allows all the services to plug in, nobody's arguing with the, the concept of JADC2. It's just how we get to, to, for a joint force to enable that fight and that data architecture. General Smith, anything else to add? Sir, I concur with uh, General Murray. We, we are involved. We, we went to a conference together out in uh, Nellis. We are daily in, in, engaged and involved with JADC2. But the concept of, which I don't think we do as good a job as we should, of, of explaining what any sensor, any shooter really means. A uh, Marine on the ground in place X should be able to pass data through the Joint All Domain Command and Control to an Army unit that then fires a prison missile or to an Air Force F-35A or that F-35B that's flying passes it to me, and I shoot a GBASM, a ground-based anti-ship missile. The concept is simply passing data, and we're being very mindful that the systems, the, the form factors that we need uh, as ground forces are able to feed into something with, without being uh, forced into a specific methodology by which to pass data. And I think we're, we're there, sir, and the cooperation collaboration is, is quite good. My last 50 seconds, we walked away from EW 
back in the mid nineties. Mm-hmm. I've heard a good, great briefing from the joint staff. I've heard one from the air force that where there was a high priority, we got a plan to write the ship. Uh, how about your services? Are you feel like we're in the same boat? Are we, are we pointed the right way, headed the right direction? Quickly, sir, for time, absolutely. So uh, systems not only to most importantly understand the electromagnetic ma- magnetic spectrum, which we don't have right now. And so yeah. first you have to understand before you can influence and impact and protect. And then actually standing up units within the multi-domain task forces that, that will have EW capability within them. Just, just from a fiscal perspective, we're committed 600 million and 21 and across the five up 3.4 billion in an area that we know we need to catch up on. And so we're committed to the way ahead. Thank you very much. I yield. Sure, we're good on Department of Navy. We can give you a brief in detail. Thank you. Yep. Mr. Lambeau. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, for both General Murray and General Smith, uh, I know your respective services are working on countering unmanned aerial surveillance uh, with the uh, combat, uh, Common Aviation Command and Control System for the Marines and the Integrated Air Defense Battle Command System for the Army. My concern is that these are going to become stovepiped. Uh, They're separate initiatives, separate ventures. And two things are wrong with that, in my opinion. Uh, It's not as good as one joint effort because two heads are better than one, right? And secondly, they won't be able to communicate and interoperate in a multi-domain environment. So are you aware of that, and are you going to work together on that a vital issue. So, sir, one, good to see you again, sir. And, and as far as CAC2S, uh, the command and control system, which for us um, incorporates all of marine air, fast movers and rotary wing, that is the overarching system underneath which um, we, we pass uh, data as far as counter UAVs. There's actually a joint um, task force, if you will, that's been stood up under the executive agency of the Army to make sure that our counter UAS systems are, in fact, joint. Those specific systems, ours is called MADIS. Uh, it's the Marine, uh, it's our small um, uh, counter UAS system that fits on a joint light tactical vehicle. Um, that is a specific system, and that is those systems are being looked at to find out which is the best to be the joint force system. The command and control architecture that's unique for a naval force versus a land force, those are in fact different, but they do have the ability to communicate and talk. So we're very comfortable with our CAC 2S because of our unique ne- uh, necessity to bring in fast moving aircraft and control airspace. Okay. General Murray. Yes, sir. So uh, IBCS, Integrated Battle Command System, is, is a system that is part of the JADC2 uh, over, overarching architecture, and it is, it, and we're having great success. We'll do a, a limited user test here pretty soon on linking air defense sensors and air defense shooters, uh, primarily from uh, the Patriot at standpoint right now, and we'll continue to integrate more and more weapon systems and more and more sensors into it as we mature the system. And as uh, General Smith mentioned, uh, under the Army's leadership, there's been an executive agency established for the Army to lead the the counter UAS effort for the Department of Defense. Um, And so inherently that will be joint because it's from all the services. We're just executive agents managing the program. And then, as you know, we have had a long history of fielding counter small UAS systems to both Iraq and Afghanistan over the past five or six years. And so there is some history to that. Along that line, does Army have plans to use Iron Dome that the Israelis have developed, but we now co- co-produce? Can I, can I go past time, sir? Or am I good? Um, so Iron Dome, the 19 NDAA, there was... Uh, and there was a report submitted that, that we would purchase two batteries of Iron Dome with the intent of integrating them into our integrated air defense system. We do air defense in layers, and so the connections between high altitude, mid altitude, and low altitude systems is very important to us. Um, it was took us longer to acquire those two batteries than we would have liked uh, for a lot of different reasons, and we are in the process right now. We believe we cannot integrate them into our air defense system based upon some interoperability challenges, some cyber challenges, and some other challenges. Um, so what we ended up having really is two standalone batteries that will be very capable, but they cannot be integrated into our air defense system. And so uh, we're working a path right now. The report came in last Friday uh, on our way forward. 
Uh, we anticipate a shoot-off open to U.S. industry, foreign industry, to, to go after whatever is the best solution to provide that capability. Okay, thank you. Okay, that's our call to vote. We're going to push this up until the point we have to run so uh, we can come back. So thank you, Mr. Lamborn, for that line of questioning. So I want to go back a little bit and try to with Mrs. Hartzler, get into some of the meat of why we're here today. Uh, so Dr. Jetty, Secretary Gertz, tens of billions of dollars have been shifted around based on night court, the national defense strategy. There's no question about that. But a clear return on investment. When we made those decisions, those trade-offs, there was risk involved. We see that each and every day, and you had to make those tough decisions. According to the 2018 September GAO report, the Army hadn't finalized a method for these investments on how we evaluate them. Can you give us an update from when that report came out to where we are today, how you're looking at the shifts that we made, and how are we evaluating against what we originally thought? So, doc, Dr. Jay, would you like to start first? Yes, sir. I, this, I, I think that we end up actually having a part of the answer from General Murray and part of the answer from, uh, from, from the ASALT side. Um, we look at return on investment. We've been, we've been relearning some things that we had uh, practiced effectively during the Cold War uh, because now we're going back to large-scale uh, uh, operations and how we can make measurements is in effectiveness. Um, so the implementation of modeling and simulation to determine whether or not a particular capability uh, that we're trying to put into a weapon systems provides us some sort of an uh, operational advantage, because the purpose here is to get a product which does something for the soldier in the field, helps us win if, uh, decisively. If we do that, then we generate in its implementation uh, deterrence. Uh, but we made the choice to go over the six priorities. How are we evaluating whether those and their associated programs underneath them were the right move? How are we evaluating that now? I'll turn that so over. One of, the, one of the beauties of standing up AFC is I own probably 70 percent of the analysts, the horses um, in the Army. And so we have, over the course of the, even before we named the six priorities, we did uh, some sophisticated modeling and simulation uh, where we injected potential capabilities of the things that we were developing and measured differences in outcomes of those scenarios. In the scenarios, I won't get into them here, but they were tied to specific places and specific locations in the world. So we established a base case with current capabilities and current tactics and current doctrine, and then we modified the scenario and also updated our opponents' capabilities where we project them to be and then begin to measure the difference capability by capability, platform by platform, developmental program by developmental program on what those differences were and how much of a difference that investment would make. So where you are today, <clears throat> those decisions were made, those investments were made, although just the beginning, you still feel across the spectrum of those decisions you're on target for what you originally planned? I do, sir. Um, and as budgets flatten, and as a matter of fact, uh, you know, if you look across the fight up, it's not uh, lo it's not one percent lost buying power. It's we're about seven billion dollars of lost buying power if we remain flat across the fight up. Um, there are still some tough decisions to be made. And when we talked about night court, there were a lot of tough decisions, and those tough decisions could lead into within the, the 31 plus three signature programs. Uh, we just don't know yet, because there are some that, depending on where you are in the world, contribute more than others. And so we still have a lot of tough decisions to make in the future. We understand the dollars and cents, but the direction is the important one that we are investing, and we're now measuring that investment that it was the right way. So, Terry Gertz. Yes, yeah, sir. Sure. I, I think of your question in two uh, aspects. One is uh, how do we measure the risk and performance uh, of the trades we made on the battlefield? Ultimately, that's you know in the warfighter's eyes. Uh, and the biggest risk is in that transition. As you you know, we're facing tough decisions, F-18 lines, P-8 line, a lot of places where getting the when do you stop and when do you you know what's when you have enough confidence to start. 
is is really challenging and having uh, having being very thoughtful about where your outs are if you didn't get it quite right and where you're at the point of no return. So we spent a lot of time thinking that. The other transformation is not what we're buying, but how we're buying it. Uh, and that, I don't think you have the same level of risk. As you heard in my hearing yesterday, we've saved $25 billion just by buying the equipment using modern, more uh, thoughtful acquisition methods. That, I don't, so the risk in that calculation is not the same as the war fighting risk. We've got to go on both of those uh, directions, uh, but be thoughtful. And then last, um, we have to work on the absorption rate of the field to be able to absorb new technology. So even if I can deliver it quickly, uh, if we don't have the training and the education and the force design right, uh, it won't matter how fast I can get it out there, I can't absorb it. And so a lot of very thoughtful work in the Marine Corps, particularly about how to train to absorb new systems, uh, because if you, if you don't have that third element right, you can do the first two great, and then it all backs up in the motor pool. So I, I want to pursue that, but I want to give my ranking member before we go to vote. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Jetty, I was very encouraged by uh, General Murray's comments uh, about development of the next generation squad weapon, and I just uh, applaud what you're, you're doing, having the soldier look at it and making those revisions. That makes so much sense. And uh, this new next generation squad weapon, of course, is going to require a new caliber um, to be using these weapons, a 6.8 millimeter round. I understand that Ammunition is going to be produced at Lake City Ammunition Plant in Missouri, which we're very excited about. Many of my constituents work there and have worked there for years. I'm very proud of what they do. Could you update us on this effort, and do you require any additional funding in fiscal year 2021 for additional tooling or modernized equipment at Lake City? Thank you, ma'am. Um, so the, the, we, we have three candidates. Uh, each of the three candidates have different configurations for the uh, 6.8 round. Um, uh, one of them looks very much similar to a conventional bullet that we're all used to. The uh, second one looks more like a lipstick case. Yeah. And uh, the third one looks uh, somewhat similar to the conventional bullet, but it's shaped like it, I had a chance plastic. to see those. Uh, ah. so, yeah, very interesting. Um, the, the, the good part about that is that uh, we think that the performance of the weapons are show, showing great promise. Uh, the tough thing that it leaves me with, just as you're alluding to, is now how the heck do I make all of those? Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know which one, but when I do decide that I'm going to make them, then we have to make a lot of them. Uh, Lake City is where we intend to produce them, and what we are working preliminarily with uh, the, 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 the vendors is being able to take the technology that they're use, using. In, in the case of this, the brass casing, we, we just have to redo dies and, and things, and we can use similar machines we already have in place. In the case of the other two, we'll have to develop some new equipment, but they've already developed that equipment as part of their development scheme. Good. So we'll probably be producing the initial tranche for a year or two as we reset Lake City and be able to put the equipment in place. But uh, as far as uh, funding goes, do you think you're going to need any additional funding? Are we spot on uh, uh, for what you anticipate as new tooling, machining to make this? Yes, ma'am. Right now, I think that we're fine. Okay. And uh, General Smith, as far as the Marine Corps, uh, can you discuss similar efforts in developing the next generation small arms capability and how, they're, how you're coordinating with the, with the Army? Yes, ma'am. So we, we coordinate on all of our small arms to include uh, the next generation squad weapon uh, and IVAS. We have Marines involved in the IVAS testing. So what we're committed to is the best weapon system that the Marines can have. So what we will do is continue to coordinate with Army Futures Command in all the testing, the requirements development, so that what we owe you is where there are differences, where we find a difference, where we need as a navally focused uh, force, um, we have to explain that to you. We, have to, we can't just say, well, we're different because we're different. We have to explain that to you. But right now, we are in step with and coordinating closely everything from the modular handgun all the way up through squad, uh, mm -hmm. next generation squad weapon with the Army. At this point, have you seen any differences that you're going to need uh, as the Marines compared to the Army? I don't see anything in the small arms category, ma'am. Okay. Uh, we're working joint sniper rifles, et cetera. So, frankly, in the small arms category, no, ma'am, and to include body armor. Very good. Thank you. Are we going to? Ask more questions now? Or? Uh, we're up against votes, so we're going to suspend our votes. 
We don't think it's going to be an hour, but it could be up to an hour. We're going to come back because we just got our first top line in. It's not easy to get you all in one room at one time, so uh, we will suspend uh, subject to the call of the chair. Thank you. We got great coffee in the back, so thank you.
again, thank you for uh, bearing with us. Uh, democracy takes time, and certainly we just went through some of that. Um, so I want to pick up where uh, I dropped off with regards to measuring the reallocation and, uh, and the requirement that we have. Are we doing the right thing? Are we getting the right outcomes, at least in year two? So General Murray, you started to say the process of, by which you're measuring the ability to get things done in an appropriate amount of time and more touch points along the way, which we all agree with. In fact, we'll talk about IVATS in a little bit. Microsoft, I think, is a great case study on how to do it. So that's the method by where we go. What I want to say and ask you, we reallocated based on new six priorities. Within those six, many programs, are we going in the right direction? Have we measured those decision points, not how we're getting to it, but is it the right decision? Did we make the right move? Any indication on that, and how are you measuring that? So there's lots of elements to this, Mr. Chairman. And there is, and this is why we want to have that right. discussion. Um, there's the industrial base risk is some of the, the things that were unfunded or uh, reduced or, or eliminated. I mean, there's that risk. There is um, the risk of going fast and making mistakes as you go along to get capability in the hands of soldiers. There is risk in that we're prioritizing the wrong things, which I think you are now focused on. And that's where I would go back to uh, what I, I tried to explain before is um, the ultimate this, you know, I guess the ultimate judge of whether we made the right decisions hopefully will never happen, that we never have to use these capabilities in, a, in an all-out conflict, and that's going to be the ultimate judge of whether we made the right decisions or not. Short of that, um, we do have uh, ways of conducting modeling and simulation and some pretty realistic scenarios, and in those cases, we are substantially better off in multiple theaters than we were with the equipment uh, that, that it's replacing. You're comfortable with that? Yes, sir. Please. When I first came in as the uh, G8, sir, about, uh, I don't know, 18 months ago, Secretary Esper, our Sec Army at the time, said, listen, in Deep Dive 1, I knew, I knew we took a lot of risk in, on this program to take the dollars that I thought we needed to place against the modernization priorities. So when you do Deep Dive 2, which is up here on the hill right now that you're looking at. Uh, I want you to do analysis to see where there was any unacceptable risk. And so do the analysis as you build the current pro this program we're discussing now. And in that process, we identified 12 programs that we put in almost $600 million against uh, based on that analysis. It went through Dr. Jetty and General Murray, but it had to go actually all the way to Secretary Esper and General Milley that they would they had to prove putting any dollars back in that were reduced or eliminated the time before. On the legacy programs. Yes, sir. And so we have the details. We can provide that to your staff as a part of our process. Yes, sir. Kind of to build on that, I would say, you know, we talk about a hollow force. Um, we also guard very closely in the Department of the Navy um, hollow acquisition programs. Uh, as you try and do a lot and you got uh, resources, you can, if not careful, get optimistic or overly optimistic and close off paths. And so we spend a lot of time looking to make sure, okay, we're going to make a pivot. We're going to transition. Where else will transition risk? And are we going to transition to a program that's whole as opposed to transition to a hollow program? Where I've seen issues in the past is where we've become too optimistic, hollowed out the program and, you know, had to have a 350-yard drive and then our best five iron and one putt in from 30 feet as opposed to have the right programs to pivot into with an ability to go back out if that pivot wasn't the right one. We all believe that we'll be batting a 1,000, but there are times that through technology or other reasons that we're not getting to where we expect it. Yes, sir, but I, but I would also counter the risk, the risk of playing it too safe or the risk of not – uh, looking at this of a pacing threat and the risk of not doing something for fear that we don't have it a thousand percent right, 
uh, is also not the right way to go. And so we've got to balance. We've got to be ready tonight, but I don't want to in 2030 be ready for a 2020 fight. And that's where I think uh, the leadership and, – and part of it's a really um, – the, the best way to get after it, I find, in my SOCOM days, was the more closely you can link warfighter to acquisition to technologists, close that distance down, like you're seeing here between Futures Command and the Army acquisition of G8, which you're seeing here with General Smith and I. So that's a com – it's an iterative loop. What do you need? How can you get it to me? What do I need to get it to you? And, and that's a constant dialogue. The closer that link is with Congress as a clear partner in that, that's when we can get our uh, institutional speed up. That institutional speed is our best hedge against risk, both in terms of are we going to the right thing or have we pivoted too fast and we need to have a fallback plan. So exactly where we wanted to go. So you're comfortable with the decisions and the priorities. Now we're discussing the speed of which, which – are actually dollars and technology that you're combining to those. Uh, where is your biggest challenge right now in terms of anticipated um, where you would be at this point and where you actually are? And is it a technology issue or is it a dollar issue? So let's go right back. Chairman, I'll, I'll, I'll take that from our side. I would say it is it is both. Um, how, do we, how do we reference point are we where we should be? No, sir, we're not. Uh, General Berger's focus has been on being prepared in, by 2030 for what he calls the decade of uncertainty. We, we know that the pacing threat continues to move, and we cannot continue to, to hold at our, at our current uh, mission sets and our current requirements. We have to move toward uh, the pacing threat. Well, I think we, we'll stipulate we all know we aren't where we want to be. So but are we where we anticipated to be at this point since the change? Sure, sure we are. Uh, General Berger has been pretty clear that the, that the budget, 21, is the, the budget upon which we pivot to his future force, what he wants to do. So for us, things like ground-based anti-ship missile, which is our number one uh, ground program, we have to get that if we're going to be um, the, the component that the Navy, the fleet commanders need, our fleet marine force to provide to the joint force. We're the littoral force as it is. The missile systems that we fire, the weapons we fire, should clearly be able to strike a ship and actually do cost imposition. And I'll very quickly show our, for example, a naval strike missile, which is already produced by the Navy, so it's a program that we, we pick up off the shelf. It's about 1.7 million. When that begins to go after to significantly damage or a couple of them to sink a billion-plus-dollar enemy warship, that's real cost imposition. That's what we're striving toward. We are exactly now where I think we need to be. We'll test fire that system. For example, this June, we test fired the sled upon which it will fire, joint light tactical vehicle in yep. December successfully. We'll fire the missile this June, and then we'll be in a position to take advantage of that and actually move forward with a capability that the joint force wants and must have to compete with a peer competitor. Okay. What we're going to do is I'm going to give Mrs. Hartz her chance, and we'll just put it back and forth. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman. Uh, I appreciate uh, the strategy and what, what you're doing, uh, and it is tough looking at the risk and how fast to go. Supply chain is certainly part of that, industrial base, uh, keeping that going for not only modernization, but also to be able to continue to repair and to uh, take care of what we already have into the future. So tough job, and I look forward to, I uh, appreciate this discussion with members here so that we can help help in this transition. I wanted to ask some questions about some more specific programs and, and as we make this transition. So start with Dr. Jetty. I understand that the long range precision fires remains the Army's number one modernization priority and the precision strike missile is a critical program within that mission area. So what is the Army doing to ensure continued competition in the precision strike missile program and are there lessons learned from the optionally manned fighting vehicle effort that could be applied here? Um, first, ma'am, you're, you're correct. Uh, Long-range precision fires is the number one priority. Um, uh, a bit to uh, uh, the chairman's question, uh, one of the other things that we're contributing to to make sure we've got things scaled right is uh, I know that uh, General Murray and his team are working on a uh, fires study uh, to make sure that we even have within that within that uh, focus area the right the right priorities, um, and so we're very supportive of that. 
uh, precision strike missile. We um, recently had a test firing. Uh, uh, of the missiles, that we had two candidates. The two candidates, uh, one missile was successful firing, the other missile had some technical problems. Uh, not insurmountable. And um, where we are with that is we'll have another test firing, I believe, later this month, uh, early next month. I can get you, I'll get you the uh, exact time we're going to do the testing. Um, so we'll, we definitely know one candidate's ready uh, to go to that firing, the other candidate has some uh, makeup to, to do. Mm -hmm. uh, we are currently negotiating with them as to how to resolve that because we have to keep a level playing field between two competitors. I can't, I can't give someone else more money than I gave the other ones and I'm getting someplace with one competitor and, and, and uh, the other one has to uh, make some adjustments. So uh, we're trying to negotiate out an fair and equitable deal within our, within our authorities mm -hmm. uh, to see if we can, we can keep the second competitor uh, involved. Great. We're, I'm interested in, in uh, General Murray, your test, your fire study that's underway. Um, when is that going to be completed? And should we uh, wait till that is done but to inform the uh, requirements for the, the missiles that you're developing? So um, it is due to be done at the end of this month. I got to see the secretary and the chief here probably shortly after it's done. And then, you know, once the chief and the secretary get to look at it, I'd be happy to come up and, and talk to you about it. It was, it was designed um, to look within the fires portfolio uh, across the prism missile, across um, long range cannon artillery to look. So we had a number of programs inside long range precision fires. And what it was designed to do is go out to the two theaters, Indopaycom and UCOM, and specifically the, the targeteers and look at their targeting work list, if you will, and then try to figure out the most important investments within the portfolio. So we can kind of rank order from one and look where there were similarities and where, where there was vast differences in how the theaters and, and the actual warfighters valued those capabilities. So it wasn't specific to the two competitors for PRISM or a specific, you know, program itself. It was more of a, of a rank ordering uh, within that portfolio, what's most valued by the warfighter. That's great. I love your approach of starting with the warfighter, what's the needs. And, Dr. Jetty, there'll be time then to incorporate what your lessons learned in, in this other. Very good. I uh, wanted to ask uh, General uh, Smith, and, and uh, I love General Murray's um, quote from earlier, your comments, a joint team wins. I love that. And then you said, winning matters, winning together matters most. I may make a poster on that or something. That's, that's good stuff, good stuff. And, and so I know you, uh, the Marines, is also looking at uh, the precision fires development long range. So um, how are you coordinating with the Army in this development process, and where are you in developing this new weapon? So, ma'am, the Secretary of Defense, by January of 20, asked us to deliver the, all of us, the Joint Force, to deliver the Joint Warfighting concept. And underneath that, there's a precision fires, a long-range precision fires piece, which the Navy leads. Uh, the Navy, each of the services has an element of logistics, et cetera. So we are coordinating on, um, on the concept of long-range precision fires, although what we are seeking now is, uh, is a, a system with an active warhead that can go after, an active seeker go after a ship as the littoral combat force, things that we fire, we can, we're capable of firing an Army ATAC comes off of our HIMARS, uh, high, art high mobility artillery rocket system now, but what we're not capable of doing is going after a ship that is moving, a land-based target we can do. We have to have a system that will go after this. So the Deputy Secretary of Defense just tasked us to take over the uh, ground launch cruise missile um, uh, way forward, and that'll go after things like uh, tactical Tomahawks, Navy strike missiles, Navy strike missiles and um, naval tomahawk that's got an active seeker that gets you at ranges of 750 and beyond. That's what matters in, a, in the contested environment of the South China Sea or um, in the indo pacom area. And we are coordinating. I just talked to the Army Prison PM probably two months ago out at uh, DARPA. And so we are coordinating. And I think much of what we'll do in the ground launch cruise missile arena will be things we'll actually uh, pass for consideration to the Army. But we talk about that. Um, on a very regular basis, so we're not stove piping or railroad tracking that we're Thank integrating. You. Thank you for doing that. It makes sense to have some commonality, but then you may have some variations that's needed uh, depending on the theater, so it makes if sense. If I could add, so it's, yeah. it's often overlooked. So we talk about the missile all the time, and, and 
General Smith mentioned uh, the HIMARS, and so one of the design principles of the PRISM is it's the same launcher we've always had, so we're not having to buy new launchers, and it's it, one, two missiles now fit in one pod as opposed to two, uh, one in one pod, so we've doubled the loadout, and we're using existing launchers, which the Marine Corps also has. Great, great. I love your approach. Keep it up. Thanks. You bet. The night court and what we went through, there were some things that appeared to have worked pretty well and things that might be a little bit challenged. Let me start with IVAS. Uh, Microsoft, and we've been out there and, and been briefed, seems to be quite different. Uh, I don't know if it's Microsoft's approach to things, if it's the new future command, but it is different. And I think we're hearing that from both sides. But as we move down and the touch points which you've talked about, we're going to come to a decision whether or not in the uh, this year's budget requesting close to a billion dollars for the actual purchase for 40000 Are we flying before we buy this? Have, are you going to be comfortable going right to 40000 And then, General Murray, What's the magic about 40,000? Where does that number come from? Instead of saying 5,000, get them out to the field and get some more real-time feedback. Uh, to answer your first part, first question, Mr. Chairman, yes, I'm, I'm very comfortable. And it is, it is primarily based upon the number of soldier interactions we've had uh, with, with IVAS. It's primarily based upon the feedback we've gotten from soldiers, which we never would have gotten before until we did the traditional way of taking it to a limited user uh, test evaluation. And then we would go into some sort of EMD, we go into some sort of, and so the intent is, and, and this large spike in funding is, we wanna buy this out in two years and get the buy done. It is a limited number. It's not designed for every soldier uh, in the Army, and, and I'm sure Marine Corps is looking at this the same way, is we talked a couple years ago about what we called the close combat uh, force. And so this is designed for uh, those soldiers that will be in close combat. We call it the close combat 100,000. Uh, it's probably going to end up being about 120,000 over the lifetime of the buy, uh, but it is a, it is a very unique uh, capability that will go to those soldiers that execute close combat at the, and we kind of define that by the platoon level and below. So it's more than just infantry. It would be some of the forward observers, some of the medics, et cetera. Um, but to answer your question specifically, I just think, you know, we've basically done probably at least a dozen LUTs in the development of this program, and so I'm very comfortable with where we are. And just to drill down a little bit on that, in the environments, the physical environments, we, we haven't been out, as I understand, in the jungle. We certainly haven't been up into the cold regions. How do you mitigate those factors into the um, operation of the units? Um, so we, we will eventually get up to the Alaska test range and we'll eventually get down to, to Panama and, and to the, the and, but we do have at each of our test centers ways of recreating some of those environments. So you have the option of either going to Alaska. Um, I was at um, Natick and it's not, they weren't testing IVAS, but I was at Natick the other day and talked to some soldiers that were testing cold weather gear and walked into the chamber with them at 20 below zero. Um, and so we have the, we have the opportunity and, and ways of recreating those environments on our current test facilities and in our current lab systems. So you're telling me we're going through that presently, we just physically haven't been to the different environments? We, we will get them through that level of testing, yes. Because again, I, I think Ms. Hartz would agree, Microsoft appears to be very different. So far, the feedback going back and forth works very well. The step to a billion dollars is a very big step. I, I like to refer to Reagan, we'll trust, but we want to verify before we start doing this. So are you looking, you said two years, is that a uh, 20,000 per year? No, the number will actually be much higher than 40,000. Um, and so, in, in General Pasquare, I can correct me if I'm wrong, but the original plan was to buy that capability out in two years. And the actual number of IVAS systems will be somewhere between probably 100,000 and 130,000. So the 40,000 would still, that's not full rate production. We're not moving without any chance of 
correction. A change or a correction. We're always trying to learn and adjust as we go. Because as you know, once they hit the field, there's varieties. Okay, so let me switch to the other side of the coin where things have been a little bit more challenged and the uh, our fighting vehicle, the OMFV. Going into this, it started long before the Futures Command got into full swing. But the idea of asking our partners, giving them the requirements that I'll call soft, general areas that we wanted to do, they made a tremendous investment by company. And yet here we are canceling the program. Could be for good reasons. We're not disputing that. We asked them to make an investment, and now we're switching. How do we keep saying to our industrial base, okay, that was a screw-up. Your investment's not lost. We're going here. I mean, for any company to make those sort of investments, it's a risk. We understand. They knew what was going in. But it doesn't help our case that this is the new way that we're going to do things and bringing the industry along. So I'd like to hear each of your opinions on how our partners are going to react to this. Dr. Jetty, if you. Sir, uh, in the, in the first, uh, first of all, what I want to say is um, the fundamental of OMFB hasn't changed. We aren't, aren't canceling the OMFB. Much like in prior systems, I know people reflect back to FCS and say, oh, you, you canceled that vehicle program, you canceled another vehicle program, here you're going and doing it again. That's not, not intending, that's not our intent. Our intent is to continue uh, with OMFB. Um, when we used the um, MTA authorities, we knew that the objective was to try and move forward as quickly as possible and make our assessments of how we were doing rather than, let's say, some of our prior, uh, prior efforts, uh, Comanche. You know, we had problems and we just kept going along, see if we could fix them, fix them, fix them, and a few billion dollars a year later, we ended up canceling. So our view of this was uh, to start out with a program that was MTA, go fast because that's what we understood, and, and by, I think that the, the way that the secretary has described it, an unprecedented interaction with industry. The secretary and the chief both spent an entire day, just them, with CEOs of the corporation mm -hmm. to get them involved. So we gained a great deal of their input, and I think that uh, when, when, we, when we finally came to the conclusion that, that we needed to, to reset, it wasn't that we didn't have input from industry. They, they told us what they, they said they could do when we put it all together in a package and, and put it out there uh, and said, okay, now put this all together in one piece. Um, we, we ended up where we were. Uh, but what was the mechanism that didn't work to stop this further back before they went all the way through the submission phase? It, it didn't come up at the last moment, obviously. But why weren't we able to intercept that based on the way that you're looking at this and an earlier point before one dropped out, the other one couldn't make it across the finish line, and we end up with one. So I think that was part of our assessment uh, in how we're trying to move forward. Um, if you, I've, I've sort of described the new method, which is we, we, have a, we have an interaction with industry phase right now. In fact, it's ongoing. Um, subsequent to the, this, they'll submit white papers, and we'll have five uh, OEMs that we'll select, down select to. We're not going to bending metal at that point because that was one of the things that I think was part of the issue with the first one. In trying to go so fast, we asked for vehicle deliveries of prototypes at the very beginning. Instead, what we need to do is we need to keep we need to lower the bar. That that itself pushed people out of competition. Lower the bar for investment? Yes, sir. Okay. So 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 more people could enter the competition and 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 participate, get things past their boards. So in this case, Going to a digital design requires them to be professional in their engineering capabilities, but doesn't require them necessarily to bend metal. It also gives us an ability to take the money that we, we're, we're, we have in the program and apply it to multiple vendors to keep the competition in place longer. The digital design phase is a stagnant design. They don't just give it to us and then that's it. Each one of these vendors are going to continue to have an interactive discussion. So 
as General Murray has said on the soldier touch points that, that we've gone through on IBAS, we're going to be doing virtual soldier touch points as well. In some cases, we'll do mock-ups of certain aspects of, of the equipment to see if it's really going to work the way that we think it's going to work or not. So we're not spending a great deal of money on bending metal and soldering pieces together or welding pieces together, but in fact, getting the knowledge that we need. At the end of that phase, instead of a requirement, which, which is what we've done, this is, in my view, one of the more, most innovative things that we've come out of this effort. An, another change was that we originally said, here's the requirement document. Here are the things you have to deliver, show up. Right. But it's a requirement document. Requirement documents are pretty stiff. Those are appropriate, and we spent quite a bit of time together, General Murray and I, just going over that one aspect of this. We, have a, we don't have a really good lexicon for how to do this smarter, so we ended up building one. Requirements, in our view at this point, are for things we're going to build where we're pretty specific. That's production. If we're doing a prototyping phase in MTA, we want to evolve the requirements as we learn through the the, the um, uh, phases of your, your prototyping. So he starts off with an operational, that's what's out there today, an operational characteristics. It's a requirement, but it's, we used a different term because it's not this rigid thing at the end. As we go through each of those phases, we, up, we, we will revise the operational and technical characteristics for each of them based upon what we learn. When we get into a phase, we will interact with the um, uh, the vendors that are involved and get them to do just what you've asked us to do. Tell us what they think that we haven't asked for. Let us make assessments. Let us do modeling and simulation concurrently. Let's do studies and analysis. Let's get soldier touch points involved here. And then come back at the end of that next phase for them to compete for the down, next down select with, with, an, uh, with a revised set of characteristics. So without beating this subject up, industry made a sizable investment. You, they now hear and see what you're talking about now. Are they going to continue this and be partners? Or do you think instead of three, we're going to open up to six, taking in place some maybe original manufacturing equipment, things that can make it much less costly than starting from scratch? Where's industry with us? Because I know what we've heard, and it hasn't been pretty uh, because of their investment. You know, they felt as if if we were going to be here, we could have done this many millions of dollars sooner. And I'm honing in on this because it's the fundamental change of industry coming with us, not just we're telling them what to do. And I think it's indicative of what we are going to do. We just chalk this one off, and do they understand that we now, as you would say, irreversible, we're not going to use that old model, this is our new model? Sir, last week I met with our big, this kind of big vehicle manufacturers, and uh, I was taking a look at uh, Mobile Protect and Firepower, MPF. And we, I had this discussion with them. Um, I understand it, it's a sting. Uh, I also understand that, that some of the things that they've done are still viable and useful in the next phase. So um, uh, we're, we're trying to do as, be as supportive as possible in the process. So far, my estimate is that, uh, that at least what I would consider the standard competitors are still intending to participate. And there are a number of others who have talked to the PEO already. I think he said 11 so far have talked Good. to him about, uh, about this. And the PEO, one of the other things that I think that we've really tried to do within, within my time as ASALT has been make sure all the way down to the PEOs and PMs, our doors are open. If industry wants to come in, they just have to get, get a meeting with us and we'll, we'll do that. Okay. And, sir, if I could real quick, I mean, so, and I think the root of this is trust. I mean, the trust going forward, yeah. and I agree with you 100%. And I just want to make sure you understand this was not a quick or easy decision uh, when we decided to restart the program. So we went through 
probably two, three, four weeks of discussion uh, Dr. Jed and I were part of along with the Army senior leadership. And, and there was a lot of debate. Uh, the issues you're talking about were brought up and discussed, and ultimately the decision was made to restart the program. But it was not an easy decision. We've learned by it. We'll get back to some more of my questions. Ms. Sarcher. Thank you. Yeah, it's good discussion here, and I have a couple of uh, fairly short questions still dealing with this program, and then another one uh, before I give it back to the chairman for a few minutes. But um, how does restructuring of the optionally manned fighting vehicle program affect plans for further upgrades and feeling of modernized Bradley infantry fighting vehicles, and how important is competition? Uh, well, we've kind of covered that. So to fielding the ones that we have now, how is the restructuring of this program going to affect their further upgrades? So uh, the, the M2 Bradley, um, there is money and plans to upgrade to the A4 version for, I believe it's now down to four brigades worth of, of vehicles. Between four and five. Between four and five. So the, the plans before um, that we had, it has not impacted that at all. The, and that would be the last upgrade to the Bradley fighting vehicle. Um, and, and you've heard me say this before. You've probably heard the chief to say it, say it before. Is the Bradley has been a, a, a phenomenal vehicle. Development of the Bradley started in 1963 mm -hmm. um, and delivered in 1981 was the first Bradleys we delivered. So, and we've run out of room to upgrade the Bradley. One of the major issues with the Bradley is, is power. Um, it's an underpowered vehicle right now. The A4 fixes some of that, uh, but we have got to, and that's why we remain committed to the OMFV program. Uh, we have got to replace the Bradley. We, we just run out of room to continue to upgrade it, but the plans that were there are still in the program. Okay, that's good. And it's my understanding the Army's planning to use a digital engineering approach as part of the restructured optionally manned fighting vehicle effort. Um, the Air Force, through Dr. Roper, is also using digital engineering and digital manufacturing from many of their advanced weapon systems. I'm big fan of this. I think this is a, a tremendous the way it should we should go. It's the way the commercial industry is going. So I have just curious, have you reached out to Dr. Roper and the Air Force to gain any insights uh, that they may have in respect to this approach? So one of the, one of the uh, one of the fortuitous things is that uh, the three uh, acquisition executives knew each other well before we ended up in the same seat in these seats. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and so have a pretty good relationship. Um, I've reached out to Dr. Roper on, on this and a number of other issues, and we are trying to share as best as possible across our programs. Um, I will tell you that we, we are sharing even into the black world. Any of our, any of our uh, uh, classified programs, we've given full open access to. Um, and the idea there is I don't need to invent anything he's already done. Exactly. So exactly. We're, we're trying to uh, maximize our leverage of each other's development work. That's great. Very encouraging. And uh, on, a, on another topic, uh, Dr. Jetty, and, and this was from an earlier question as well, we talked about Lake City uh, and ammunition. <clears throat> it says the Army's budget request for 5.56 millimeter ammunition is $68.5 million. This is a slight increase uh, from FY20. However, it appears from what we've learned in the last week or two that this request did not take into consideration the change in contractor management at Lake City, plus the increase in cost to produce enhanced performance 5.56 millimeter rounds. Based on initial estimates that I've seen from the contractor, the 5.56 millimeter line would need an increase of $37.6 million just to maintain current capacity and produce 310 million rounds of ammunition. So did the Army consider these costs increased when it prepared the FY21 budget request? And what actions are you taking to mitigate any shortfalls in 556 uh, millimeter ammunition production? I would just start on the ammunition in general and specifically on 5.56. Five, we go line by line every year on our requirements for ammunition, ma'am. Uh, and because and each year we have a, uh, we, we check our, what our training plan is, our training strategy, uh, combat commander requirements, uh, and actually how we fight, we plan on fighting in the future, and that drives the number. And then uh, we, we want, we must fund everything we must have, and we can't afford to buy more ammunition than we have, than that amount. 
So I'll, we are, I'm not, I don't have the details exactly on the 556. I owe you that back. Uh, yeah. from this is just something we learned about recently. It's my understanding, uh, you know, the requirement hasn't changed, but the cost has is what's yeah. needed to create that same amount of uh, ammunition. So, so we'll, the we'll have former contractor that. lost a significant amount of money, and the new one basically can't afford to make the amount at that same price and needs more money if it is to be able to fulfill that. Anyway, so yeah. um, if you could look at that and get back with us, that sounds great. Thank you. Ma'am, can I just add, we're sure. taking, uh, so I've restructured how we're approaching the organic industrial base uh, within ASALT. Um, I've not, I've, uh, I have a centrally selected uh, program manager, uh, Colonel, who is now basically the mayor governor of these facilities. Um, he has full control over the contracts, and we're looking at all the contracting methodologies. Um, if I was to do a very uh, top view of, of, of how we've approached these, it was all very close in battles. I need a new doorknob for something. There was no prediction of where we needed to go, what we needed to do. Do I need more ammo capacity for this caliber? Do I need less? How about the machines? How easy are the refit? Et cetera, et cetera. So we're taking a stem to stern, if I can borrow that from the Navy, <laughs> uh, 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 look at just exactly how do we run these facilities to optimize them and not end up with a mountain of the wrong caliber ammo. Very good. Thanks. Understanding that the um, you're still pending for structure modernization priority, as we spoke about earlier. Yet, we're in the middle of a budget season. Explain to us what lightened the force means and where is that taking you, not only in this budget cycle, but beyond. Sure, I, I truly do appreciate that question. Um, lighten the force means exactly that, and I'll, I'll get to the, to the very important why. Logistics is and can be an Achilles heel of any operation. As we talk about pacing threat and we talk about operating in the Indo-Pacific, our ability to sustain ourselves inside the weapons engagement zone as the quote stand-in forces depends on our being able to resupply and sustain those forces that are, for example, within the first island chain or frankly anywhere globally. Every, every pound that we take off, whether it's the polymer ammunition that we're working with the Army, we're doing 50 caliber, the Army's doing 7.62 and the Brits are doing 5.56 five, uh, to lighten the load by 20 or so percent to uh, some of the, the battery uh, packs that we're working out with Johns Hopkins that will lighten our battery ability, our, our ability to generate our own power, to water purification, to physically go into, from ceramic plates down to plastic plates, which we're working now on personal protective equipment, to the Rogue Fires vehicle, which is a joint light tactical vehicle stripped of most of its armor. And that starts lightening things by thousands of pounds Every, every short ton that I take off is a short ton that my counterpart in the Navy, uh, Vice Admiral Jim Kilby, does not have to transport and move. That matters to the operational commander. That gets me to the fight faster. It means my resupply mechanisms are less, need to be less robust, and it means I can sustain myself inside, myself inside that weapons engagement zone. For me, that's pretty important because I personally have a second lieutenant son who is inside that weapons engagement zone now. He's forward deployed in Japan and he's a logistics officer, so we talk about this. That's my back channel to how we're doing, if we're actually doing what we're supposed to be doing. I get an earful every time I talk to him. Um, that is what light it means. Everything from helmets to body armor to ammunition to vehicles to form factors of radios, batteries, power, all of that combined, sir, because every pound adds toward a short time. Is it also with sheer numbers? I'm sorry, sir? Also with sheer numbers? Oh, absolutely, sure, absolutely. When we, just, when we did some of the studies we've been doing with the Navy, for how we will sustain ourselves, we actually calculated how big is an expeditionary advanced base, which is really a platoon-sized unit reinforced. We can't say it depends or it's about this big. How many exact Marines? How many radios? How many corpsmen? What are they carrying? I have to calculate that poundage out mm -hmm. that turns into short tons so I know what requirement to levy on uh, or to request of the Navy so that they can transport me. And that goes to military sea lift, which is not part of this committee, I know, but, but that is vitally important for logistics sustainment. Uh, we have not gotten lighter in the last 20 years. We've slowed the rate of weight increase, which is unacceptable. So our goal is I'm not adding a pound to 
the, the fleet marine force. We have to really reduce the weight, and we're starting to do that. I mean, we're actually having real results in uh, lightening the individual load on the marine and ultimately on the unit. So when do you think you'll reach the final number or goal oh. of where you are? Because, sir, we're in between budgets and... Sure. So, sir, we, we will never cease trying to lighten the load. I mean, every time a, a new polymer comes out that will provide similar protection, we'll take it and we'll drop weight. We're never going to cease trying to cut weight. Um, so I, I, But the force structure itself... Oh, I'm sorry, sir. The force structure, I think the commandant will start moving that. Uh, I won't get ahead of my commandant, but I believe he'll start to show that um, very soon after we get the, the 21 uh, budget explained. Uh, and then his full pivot is toward the 22 budget that will lay out force design, which are the, the changes in uh, training, manning, and equipping um, that will show which units might be morphing or changing missions. He'll start to roll that out, I believe, this spring. So I'm comfortable saying this spring for him. So this budget includes those interim numbers mm -hmm. as you're going to the new Sure, design. it does. And the Commandant made some modifications to 21. Uh, a lot of it was in training and education so that when um, we take the full step out in 22 and then 23 and 4 and beyond, that when we gain things like naval strike missile, you know, we call it GFASM, ground-based anti-ship missile, when we get that, there's a unit who is ready to fire it. Those long-range precision fire units, artillery, are ready to fire that system so that our command and control units, when these new technologies emerge, are actually uh, organized to accept that equipment and we don't have to then organized for a new technology. I, I use Moore's Law a lot, sir. Moore's Law, if we continue to accelerate the pace of change, the unit has to be able to absorb and utilize that equipment immediately. I can't, the pacing threat won't wait. I can't wait. So the Commandant's focus has been on training and educating um, the forces to use it. Again, I think I have a very smart son, but he's not trained to fire a 750 nautical mile and a ship missile. He would say he is, I would say he's not. Um, that's a, you know, his mom would probably say he is. But uh, but he needs more training. Pardon me, more training to do that. We've already begun that training to move from an industrial age to an information age training base. Because I'm fortunate that I own the training and education process for the Marine Corps, and we started that already under General Berger's leadership. Thank you, Ms. Sartre. Great, and I applaud your uh, efforts to lighten the load. And I think the new uh, generation, next generation squad weapon, and the new ammunition is very much will be part of that and so that's really exciting um dr jetty and, and my, i have to leave at 12 30 catch my plane so i'm trying to talk fast if you could help me that'd be good too uh, i have a couple more questions then i'll leave one for the record so uh during tuesday's army posture hearing secretary mccarthy testified that the army is coordinating its hypersonic development efforts with the air force and the navy um, and so could you elaborate further on these joint service coordination efforts, uh, specifically in regard to the Army's long-range hypersonic weapon? This is something I'm definitely focused on, and um, I know that all the services are. It's critical we get this capability as soon as possible. So once again, to the theme of working together, all team, um, how are you coordinating with the others? And are we reinventing the wheel, or are we working together and saving money and saving time? Yes, ma'am. Um, okay. So... The, the uh, Department of Defense has designated the Army uh, as the executive agent. Uh, we have a, a joint program going, that's not a joint program, We're, we have a cooperative program with, between the Navy and the Army uh, and with some aspects with the Air Force specifically. Uh, this program is put into my senior PEO. I have one three-star PEO and, uh, and uh, Gen Lieutenant General Neil Thurgood who has, he was the deputy director of MDA. Uh, he was a PEO of missiles in space. He's been PEO aviation, so he's got a great deal of background in this area. And he's now in charge of the material solution for hypersonics within the Army. The Navy and the Army have are fully connected at, uh, at the programmatics. Uh, they are working with the Air Force. They had some different issues with firing from an aircraft versus firing from the ground and the sea. Uh, but they're, they're continuing to work through those issues. We're responsible for the, for the commercial production of the hypersonic reentry vehicle. The Navy is uh, responsible for production of the, uh, the launch vehicle, 34-inch, uh, 34-and-a-half-inch uh, uh, launch body. And um, we, will, uh, we, we are doing joint testing so that we're not testing our piece and their piece. We're testing things together. 
the Navy's leading the first test, we follow by leading the second test, et cetera. So we're, it is truly a very well integrated program. It can't be anymore. The Navy's building all the rockets for the program, the Army's building all the glide bodies, and we're doing all the joint testing together. So it, it could not be a more uh, closely linked program. That's great. I saw the prototype, well, the picture at the Army caucus breakfast uh, the other day, and that was really interesting. So I'm glad to hear that. Um, so Dr. Jetty and General Murray, in Section 240 of the uh, NDAA, FY20, requires the Secretary of Defense to identify the military services or agencies that will be responsible for the conduct of air and missile defense in support of joint campaigns as it applies to defense against current and emerging missile threats, including against each class of cruise missile. Do you know whether the Secretary of Defense has made this certification, and can you provide any information on how this certification was coordinated with the Army? Ma'am, I'm unaware if the Secretary has made that decision yet or not. Okay. No. Okay, very good. I have a couple of questions on active protection systems uh, that I will submit for the, the record unless we have time before 1230. Thank you. Uh, we're going to try to wrap up by 1230, so okay. obviously you can make things. General Murray, Chief of Staff of the Army, unfunded priorities list includes $151 million for creation of what you're calling the Multi-Domain Operational Task Force. What's the documentary requirement from DOD or the Joint Staff for the Army to provide this capability under its Title X responsibility? So it's, it's fundamentally the same um, demand uh, that we get for just about any of their capabilities. So it came directly from the, the combatant commanders. Uh, specifically Admiral Davidson in the Pacific and from um, General Walters in U.S. Army Europe. Uh, the 151.4 is really an acceleration of, of MDTFs, multi-domain task forces two and three, two in Europe and number three for the Pacific. So that would give two in the Pacific is specifically what uh, Admiral Davidson has asked us to, pr to produce. Um, some of that is facilities and sustainment. Some of it is fleshing out an organization we call I2Q. So it's, it's, it's really the heart of the multi-domain task force. It is intelligence, it is cyber, it's electronic warfare, and it's space capabilities that really enable uh, this, the multi-domain task force. Very good. Uh, I'm wrapping up. Once you get your questions oh, in, very good. then we're going to wrap okay. things up. Um, I, I wanted to follow up first just quickly on something the chairman said, and you shared the testimony, I, I think, General Pasquet, about there's, uh, as far as risk, you went back and discovered 12 programs that before, and, and you refunded those at $600 million, and you said you could give us a list. So I was just saying, uh, could you give us a list? Yes. Yes, ma'am. I think it's up here with the staffers, but we'll follow up and make sure it gets okay. to your office. Okay. The two uh, APS questions. So what is the Army doing to maintain momentum in fielding non-developmental active protection systems for the Abrams, Bradley, and Stryker? As we believe soldier protection is our number one priority, and this capability needs to be rapidly fielded. Um, so I guess that's the, the first question. What are, you, what are you doing to maintain the momentum? And can the committee provide additional resources to assist in the fielding the remaining uh, Army Brigade combat teams as continued testing on the Stryker and the Bradley platforms? So. Well, we are, our leadership has given us direction that we're, we must uh, head down these paths for our three major systems that we're concerned about, uh, Abrams, Bradley, and Stryker. And with Abrams, thanks to the support of Congress, we, we have committed to uh, four sets of that uh, kit. We're actually mounting the A kits now. And one of those, uh, we're going to mount uh, a company, I believe, during Defender Europe is going to mount uh, one of the B kits uh, as a part of that operation to validate the, the, the means to do that. Stryker, on the other end of the spectrum, it's a tough science project. The ability to defeat a round with an active protective system um, uh, to the degree that doesn't allow penetration with the secondary effects of, uh, of what's left of the round coming at it. Uh, we're still working with industry and, and S&T world on how to do that. In the middle of that is Bradley. Where we've, uh, we've uh, looking at a similar pro uh, program, similar to uh, uh, Trophy on the Abrams, 
Uh, we're testing that right now. I defer to Dr. Jetty about how that's going. But we, we want to move forward with, a, it's called a Iron Fist Decoupled is the system. Uh, and we're, we're working to see if that's something that'll work with the Bradley or not, sir. So the, uh, the, the light system is continuing to be tested and um, determine whether or not, to determine whether or not it, it actually performs in the manner we, we want it to perform for the Bradley. Um, we are also uh, have not, we have not stopped and said, well, this is the solution. In fact, we're, we're looking for additional APS systems and approaches to systems. Um, is that been put out there for industry asking for? Yes, and if in a different form, I can show you some of the successes we've had, and they are significant. Mm -hmm. uh, they, I think, will lead us to some different views of how we execute APS. I, I believe that we have absolutely a, a need to find an alternative way to protect these vehicles from the type of fires that they can they can. Uh, uh, have to deal with. I've already got an 80-ton tank. I can't make it any heavier. And I can't make light armored vehicles Heavy. weigh 80 tons. So we're going to have to come up with a better method. And we have several technologies which we're incorporating into our OMFB effort as part of sprints. Uh, sprints are short demonstrating technology cycles which lead to the development of them. Uh, over a period of time. That, that might be a good uh, classified briefing maybe to, to learn about some of the new systems. Maybe would, would it be? Um, okay. Does the Army have sufficient APS capability to protect all armored brigade combat teams in multiple theaters? Um, so I believe you've purchased four. Yeah, not currently, ma'am. Okay. And finally, what risk is the Army incurring if it doesn't pursue other proven non-developmental APS technologies for current ground platforms like Bradley and Stryker? Well, it sounds like you are pursuing it. Uh, we are. And yeah. it, so one of the – my perspective on this is that we, we pursued things to try and get them done quickly, and we looked at NDI, non-developmental items. All, the APS is a unique category of, of a non-developmental item. It, you – if you, if you put a number of different companies in, they, they come out with their products, they bring it there, and they're going to try and sell it to you, and you don't choose one of them because you're going to choose one, maybe later a second. If you don't win the competition, you have no place to go with the product. So they're all governmentally funded. And we, didn't have a, we haven't had a governmentally funded program for APS since FCS. So... I believe that one of the things we needed to do was start opening the aperture and look for those things which we could invest in the nascent stages of these APS systems, or all we're going to ever get are the ones that are already developed by foreign governments uh, or, or uh, already exist in place. And that's one reason why there's not really a lot of NDI options laying on the table, and we just need to test them. We're going to have to do some work in development uh, to get where we need to go. So do you need more money from, to do that from us? I, I don't think we need it this year. I'm going to look at 22 when we start submitting it next year. All right. Look forward to continuing the discussion on this. Thank you very much. This has been a great, great hearing. Thank you. Let me just wrap this up sort of beginning or ending where we began. We talked about the shift to modernization, the national defense strategy, and in any of the selections that were made either to cancel a legacy or enter into one of our six priorities, uh, you're measuring against the threat as defined in the National Defense Strategy. This year there are 12 items that the Army has can that had previously canceled or reduced that were now going to continue. So that gets to the heart of my first question is that evaluation obviously took place here. Not each of the 12 items. Can you give us a little synopsis or a story? What made you reflect back and make that change to continue it? Was it the industrial base? Has the threat changed? What exactly caused this to change in the Army? I'll give an example of one system called UCS, Unified Command System. There was guidance to try and be more efficient with that. It's a, something every state is supposed to have in the National Guard in case of an emergency. Uh, to stand up quickly to react to that crisis. 
uh, and we were looking at the direction from the leadership was see if we can't consolidate it. Why do we need 54 of these? Can we have 16 regionally and you go get it when you need it? Upon reflection, because of the demand, the requirements out there in the National Guard to um, uh, react immediately, uh, the analysis was done. You can't go from Texas to Oklahoma to go get your piece of kit to come back to Texas for the emergency. So it was guidance to look at this. We took the dollars initially thinking it would work out upon analysis. Uh, we showed the leadership that you have to have it there to meet the requirement. And so there was an agreement by the decision by the secretary and the chief that, yes, let's put money back in it. That's one example. Can you give me a hardware um, example, something where a hardware piece of equipment might have been changed? Not off the top of my head, Mr. Chairman. I, there's, the, I can't re it maybe. You maybe. know, the industrial base collapses or. Or just trying to get a so feel make for sure it. I'm giving you the right answer here that fuel trucks is one of them we had we we did an assessment based upon our initial uh, assumptions in particular theaters of what our operational needs would be um, that that left went with the set of assumptions we had in the analysis that and generated the decrement in the budget uh, over the next year we went back and reviewed all of the all of the decisions we had made and found that one of the assumptions was false and what that did was it drove us to coming back and saying this assumption can't be accomplished we need to go back and relook our fuel truck requirements and then we we decided to put the fuel trucks back in i'd say another one was crypto modification we realized we were, we took money out of it and then when we looked at it we were not going to be in compliance with the nsa guidance for our, our system to operate. And so again, that was a decision made upon reflection and analysis feedback. Uh, in order to be compliant, we had to put those dollars back in. That's, that's just another example, sir. So is there a formal process to reevaluate all the programs, or is it brewing up, I'd say, from those who are in those programs saying, wait, you didn't take this into consideration, be it an industrial base or a threat? It's both, and so we get a, a significant amount of input because um, the, the things we're looking at as we go through the program review, which we're going through right now, uh, really starts at, at the low levels and it works its way through colonels and one-star generals and two-star generals and three-star generals and eventually ends up the Dr. Jetty and I. So it gets looked at at multiple points. Um, and, and there are objections raised just about every one of them um, in terms of, you know, eventually it's a, it becomes a risk decision. The, um, and another thing I'd say that's added to some of the changes is people often focus on the 31 plus 3 and that that's the only thing that the Army's investing in. It's, it's really more holistic than that. So we look at the enablers for those 31 plus 3s, and fuel, truck is a, fuel trucks are a great example. I mean, I can, I can build the best tactical vehicle in the world, and if I can't get fuel to it, it's not going to be good for much more than about a half a day. Um, so as you look at the enablers, they're not part of the 31 plus 3, but they are the critical enablers that go along with the 31 plus 3. You can imagine with any budget that comes out, my colleagues look down the list and say, oh, that's mine. Uh, we want to make sure that when we address their questions that they're based on reliable set of figures that is consistent across the program and not just you happen to be in the right state at the right time for the right thing. And that's the overarching theme because we will be with you. But when we question you on drill down on some of these subjects, it's so I can answer them and look them in the eye saying, we're going to support their decision because A, they've done this, they've reviewed it, and it's the right thing to do. So when we get these questions to you, it's so nine times out of 10, we can address questions. With that, seeing I'm the only one left, I want to thank you for your time, particularly uh, working with us during the votes, and we are adjourned.